Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Moving Forward uh, series. Uh, today's topic is how two years of COVID is impacting Canadian real estate. My name is Sean Karaj. I am the Vice Dean and Associate Dean for Programs here in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, and I want to thank you all for joining us um, and give a special welcome to our guest panelists, who you'll hear from shortly. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that we're on, um, and of course, recognizing that this is a virtual meeting. And because of that, we're not all actually gathered in the same space necessarily. York's land acknowledgement, therefore, might not represent the territory that you're currently on. And if that's the case, we just ask that you take the responsibility to acknowledge the territory that you're on and its current treaty holders. So I myself am situated in uh, the Greater Toronto Area, uh, known as Tacronto, and gratefully acknowledge that I live on the same territory as York University. Um, and as a member of our community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the uh, territories upon which our campuses are located. Uh, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations in the area known as Tacronto, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and we acknowledge that this territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So once again, welcome to this event uh, for everybody who's joining us here on Zoom. Um, and this is our last in the Moving Forward webinar series for this academic year. Um, so we've had several uh, excellent uh, interviews with alumni that we hope you'll check out uh, over on the LAMPS YouTube channel. Over the last two years, we've constantly heard news about stories on Canada's housing market reaching um, uh, historic price levels uh, and changing um, significantly during the course of the pandemic. But what's been happening in uh, commercial real estate, retail, rental, the industrial sector? Um, during this hour, we're going to hear from LAMPS alumni who hold senior positions in the real estate industry um, across a, a wide uh, number of areas within the sector um, and listen uh, to their views on uh, and perspectives on the experiences of the last couple of years and other factors that have affected uh, and altered the real estate sector in Canada. Um, these accomplished alumni are going to share a little bit about their own experiences and provide valuable advice to uh, students who are here uh, today um, to help you uh, think about, you know, potential careers uh, in real estate, if that's an, an area you've been thinking about. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, like with so many of these moving forward events, uh, we're really digging into some of the experiences across a wide number of sectors of employment um, that have uh, been disrupted by the pandemic. Uh, and real estate is one, it's on my mind a lot, and I know it's on the, the minds of a lot of Canadians. So we're going to get some really interesting insights here uh, today. If at any time you need help with the uh, experience uh, this afternoon, um, or you have questions for the panelists about the content, um, you can post your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our team will be ready here uh, to help you. And we'll also use that Q&A tool for questions that you want to pose to the panel. Um, and we'll pull your questions out of there and, and pose them to the panelists uh, who can answer um, on camera here. So let's go ahead and uh, get to meet our panel uh, this afternoon. I'll, I'll uh, quickly introduce each of the panelists and let them give you uh, a quick introduction to who they are. And we're going to start with uh, Anthony Ficini. Anthony. John, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, I look forward to hopefully providing information that is new and, and, and insightful for those that are um, watching here today. So thank you for that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anthony Facchini. Um, I am a first generation Canadian. Um, I am a, a son of immigrant that uh, was part of the big immigration wave into Canada uh, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly new. Um, I know I don't look new today, uh, but I, I was new at one point. And so as a first generation Canadian, uh, you know, what what was important for my parents at that time was to ensure that we had a better life than, than they had. Uh, and we were giving, uh, given certain privileges and opportunities that they never had and wished that they did have. So on that, uh, one of the really important things was our education for my, myself and my brother. And 
uh, as a result, I, I uh, went to York University. Uh, I lived close to York University at that time after graduating from uh, De La Salle, uh, which was a, a private boys school in downtown Toronto, um, and wanted to get into uh, economics uh, and, and learn more about economics and business. So I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in, in economics. And in doing that, um, I, I added into that or layered into that, if you will, a number of accounting courses, so managerial accounting and um, financial accounting, uh, to add to my um, my economics background. And um, ever since graduating from York University, uh, I went into what was a passion of mine at that time, and still is, 32 years later, and that is real estate. Uh, I have been uh, uh, blessed and uh, privileged to have worked on very many wonderful assets in, in the Canadian market, particularly in the GTA, but also nationally. I've worked, I've stepped in every province and I've, uh, of this country and I've uh, been coast to coast. Uh, and um, I, I've been privileged that way in, in being able to uh, travel on business and seeing um, all parts of this country. And so my career has taken me to um, every asset class, whether it be industrial, uh, shopping centers, enclosed shopping centers, uh, super centers, as you would call them, uh, in terms of uh, open air centers, uh, fashion centers uh, like Bayview Village, um, Fairview Mall, and, and a bunch of others like that. I've been in the industrial space as well, uh, talking about fulfillment centers, uh, distribution centers, uh, large, uh, larger par parcel deliv uh, delivery companies such as. Uh, UPS and uh, FedEx, um, and I've been in the multifamily residential uh, sector most recently in my career. Wanted to get out of my comfort zone, do something a little different, so I got involved in land lease communities, multifamily uh, residential and and uh, rentals, and most recently in condominiums. Um, but specifically, as it relates to condominiums, related to managing and uh, being partners with the board of directors. So every condo corp, as you know, has a board of directors that manages the business of that condo community, whether it be the physical assets and or the uh, other assets of that uh, corporation. So uh, 30, 32 years later, I've, I've, I've been able to touch many different parts of the real estate industry. And hopefully today I can, um, uh, add to your knowledge and hopefully provide you with new information. Sean, thank you. That's great, Anthony. Thanks so much. And just a taste uh, for the audience of the breadth of experience we have on the panel, uh, and you're going to get to hear more now. Um, uh, we've got Avi Bahar here. Hey, Avi. Hello, Sean. <clears throat> and uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone who's taken the time out of out of your, your day and uh, presumably your busy schedules to, to join us today. It's an honor to be here. Um, and thank you, Sean, to you and, and our gracious hosts at York. Um, and obviously to uh, my esteemed co-panelists. I'm equally excited just to kind of share the virtual stage with all of you and, and, and learn from you all. Um, and Anthony, I guess I'll, t I'll take your lead a little bit. Um, I haven't prepared a lot in terms of an intro, but if, if I can't speak at least briefly about myself then you know for a few minutes then I probably shouldn't be here and I'll try to keep it brief but uh, I too am a first generation Canadian I was I was born and raised in Toronto uh, and both of my parents uh, were immigrants although uh, my mom landed in Toronto when she was about three months old so for all intents and purposes she was born here um, and just as a very kind of quick snapshot um, of, of our business. Uh, so I, I own and operate uh, the Bahar group of companies uh, and we, we touch on kind of all things real estate with, with various businesses within the overall business. Our, our core business is the real estate brokerage and, and agency, but we also uh, ha have an asset management group and an advisory group. Um, we, we do some investment in real estate as well and um, happy to sort of answer any questions uh, later on. And just as a, as a quick history, um, I graduated York University, as you know, in 1994. I studied philosophy uh, and sciences. Philosophy was my major. Um, I can get into that later, but, but I, I think more than anything, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in life. Um, and philosophy taught me to sort of always ask the question why and just kind of explore 
uh, deeper. But both of my parents were in real estate, so I, you know, by osmosis, I sort of saw it growing up. And um, um, my father started in 1968. Uh, 24 years later, in 92, he left sort of the bigger company uh, where he was and went out onto his own. And uh, you know, in, in 95, after I graduated, I joined my parents and jokingly say that we, um, you know, we, we grew from a one-person operation out of the house, uh, not far from York campus. To a two-person operation of the house. In, in, in truth, it was three. It was myself with with my parents, um, and my mom basically kicked us out of the house every morning and said, um, "Don't come back until dinner time." And I feel like it was an amazing learning experience for me to to be able to go and find my way and to sort of have unlimited opportunity. Um, you know, but more than anything else, you know, I, I look at business as a bit of a, a microcosm of, of life in general, and it's it really is a human experience. And as we get into um, the way of, you know, what, what's happened over the past couple of years and where do we go from here? Uh, I think to me, a lot of that comes back to, to the human experience. And um, we could talk more about that shortly. Absolutely. Thanks, Avi. Um, our next panelist is uh, Haya Zilberboim. Hi, Haya. Hi, Sean. Uh, how are you? And uh, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Um, in terms of the introduction uh, of myself, uh, I moved to Canada in 2004, already educated, uh, being a CPA and had a master degree in uh, education administration, but uh, one thing that I was told uh, in the first week that I arrived to Canada uh, with my husband and my three sons is that uh, you need to have your Canadian experience uh, in order to get a job here. So I, I thought, okay, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's go back to the basic and uh, get a job at um, KPMG um, and um, so and get my Canadian CA and in order to do so I needed to take some courses uh, and I did it with your university. It was a very interesting experience because all the students were around 20 years old and I was 42, 43. Uh, and sometimes at night when I was walking uh, to the classroom, uh, some students uh, would call me professor, professor, but I was a student like them. Uh, in any event, I spent four years uh, with KPMG working on uh, my Canadian CA and then I was uh, brought to the real estate uh, industry with no experience. My work experience was in high tech for more than 10 years. Uh, and I was offered a position uh, for, uh, with the international publicly traded uh, company um, as a COO and CFO. Uh, uh, we had assets in Canada and uh, the US with a value of over a billion dollars. It was like, uh, I would say, all uh, asset class, uh, mainly uh, office, uh, enclosed shopping centers, some uh, multifamily and uh, some industrial. It was unbelievable experience because actually uh, it was exactly the, the time that we had a different disruption in the market. I started there uh, in September 2008. Uh, I know that in Canada we didn't feel it much, but uh, it was very interesting time and usually you can learn the best in, in difficult times in terms of uh, business. Um, after that, I got, uh, I, I was offered to work uh, as the CEO of uh, Greenwin, which is the largest um, a private uh, multifamily company. Uh, we had about 20,000 apartments uh, under management. We had development of new uh, rental apartments, and uh, it was amazing experience. In 2012, I felt that the opportunity in multifamily is in the US and they actually uh, decided to start my own company. So uh, 
mid 2012 uh, started Emma Capital with the the um, a vision to invest in uh, multifamily complexes in different cities in the US. The first city that I selected was Phoenix, but since then uh, a, we invested in seven different cities. We acquired about 11,000 apartments and uh, uh, amazing experience. Uh, I think the first few years was in a way being like a Columbus a exploring America. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, it was the, the right decision in terms of uh, where the opportunity was. And, uh, and I think going forward also, it is very interesting to be in this uh, field. And we're, we're really looking forward to getting to hear more um, about your perspectives and experience. Um, we've got one last panelist here, Mark Baltazar. Hey, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're situated. Yeah, really excited to be you know, part of the discussion and uh, you know, uh, connect and reconnect with uh, York students and uh, alumni. Um, so I graduated in 2003, 2004. And uh, I started off uh, as an economics major. And then after year one, realized I didn't really want to do calculus <laughs> as much anymore. Uh, and then I started to focus on uh, marketing and statistics. So I ended up kind of getting back into mathematics, but more from uh, a statistical standpoint. Uh, joined a, uh, a large, uh, well, Canada's largest restaurant company for a, a bunch of years. We were an internal uh, little consulting group. And we collaborated with McKinsey on, on a bunch of cool projects. And then um, uh, that was for a few years, and then uh, was a partner in a in a, uh, a marketing research firm um, that had some cool uh, global clients, and uh, ran that for for I guess almost fifteen years. And during that time, real estate was always you know something that I wanted to get into. Um, started to acquire properties, uh, you know, just personally. Um, and then a number of years ago, you know, finally, you know, changed changed my career path a little bit and uh, started a, um, uh, you know, smaller private equity real estate firm focusing on, on multifamily uh, here in, uh, in Ontario, primarily. And so it's been an exciting ride. I mean, I think, you know, given the, the dynamics of the last few years have made it super interesting. Um, I think, you know, challenging at first, I think everyone was, you know, worried, scared, no matter what industry, um, you, you know, you're in. Um, but I think things, you know, you learn, you adapt, you collaborate, and you, you innovate. And, uh, and I think that's probably the stories we're going to, you know, tell today. And uh, I'm just as excited as you know, everyone watching to, you know, hear from, uh, you know, fellow, fellow panelists and, uh, you know, others that are uh, in different parts of the real estate space here in, in Canada. Well, maybe I can stick with you, Mark, then for our, our first question here, which is the core question for the panel here. Um, so in, in your uh, position and your perspective on the real estate sector, uh, over the last couple of years during the course of the pandemic, what have you seen as the biggest disruptions or changes to to the real estate sector? So I, can I go back to, so I'm in the rental housing business, right? Mm -hmm. So we provide, you know, in multifamily, smaller apartment buildings, providing rental housing uh, for tenants uh, in, in the GTA and surrounding areas. And so, you know, April 1st, 2020, I think, you know, many of us in that space and perhaps in other commercial sectors, were really holding our breath. Were people going to pay? Um, what was going to happen to rents given that, you know, people were losing their jobs and, you know, everyone knows what happened in March, 2020. And so I think, you know, the, the reason why I started into multifamily in the first place was because of its resilience, because, you know, historically it, you know, did well in recessionary times and, in, in, and did well in economic uh, booms. And, you know, April, let's say April 2nd, the day, you know, and the significance of, of the first of the month is that's typically when rents come in. And so, you know, many people in our, I think our business were wondering if, if rents were going to be paid. Um, and I think what was, perhaps surprising, but I think, you know, a breath of fresh air was that many people did pay their rents. And again, I think it, it, it was, it, it proved the, the resilience of the asset class. Um, and especially in our country and specifically in our province, 
you know, there's still a shortage of housing. People, you know, it, it's the primary need, right? Housing and home. And, and, and I think it, 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 it proved that again in April, 2020. Um, I mean, the second, the sector continues to grow. The, the other kind of, I think, big learning is that, you know, Canada um, as a whole, uh, and I'd say North America as well, it, we're still a, you know, very safe place for capital and capital markets. And there's still a lot of capital flowing into, and I'll speak to Canada and Ahaya can speak to the US, but there's still a lot of capital flowing into North America because the global markets still perceive our, our regions to be a place, you know, a, you know, a safe place um, to invest. Um, hi, what's what's your perspective then on on biggest changes of the last couple of years? Mark's got a, a residential perspective here, and then I, I understand you've got quite a broad perspective and a, and a large footprint in the U.S. So um, I think the experience was different in the first three months uh, of uh, the pandemic, six months, 12, and then the past year. Um, we prepared for the worst. Uh, already in March uh, and uh, being here in Toronto and our business is in the US and the inability to fly and visit our properties, um, I think was something that we needed to deal with. Uh, the other thing was uh, the concerns that uh, Mark raised about are the tenants going to pay uh what will be the lender approach the lender's approach uh about the mortgages that we need to pay at the end of the month um are the employees going to come to the the properties we had uh a hundred of employees working for us in the u.s in each complex uh you have uh people working uh, we have offices, clubhouses. Are they safe? Uh, what's their concerns? Um, what the tenants would feel? Uh, are we going to experience uh, um, vandalism? How are we going to have control? How are we going to service these tenants? Uh, are our employees should go to any work order call? Uh, are they going to be exposed? So I think that... Uh, like we had a lot of questions, um, something that Avi likes to do, but we did, had that, a lot of questions. And I think the number one uh, approach was, okay, we need to make sure that we are sitting as, on as much as possible cash. So uh, we need to preserve cash in all our programs and all our investments. We do a... Um, a we invest a lot into the property after we buy. So we decided to stop all CapEx, all capital expenditure programs and uh, make sure that we preserve cash. Uh, we wanted to make sure that collection uh, is done and how can we in incentivize uh, uh, the tenants to pay and to pay on time. And uh, I think there was fear in the air and a lot of unknown. And I made uh, a mistake, not a big one, but is the, because of the fear, uh, we decided to offer an incentive for uh, our tenants if they pay before April 1st uh, their rent, then we'll give them money. And I think this incentive cost me about $150,000. Uh, and then we didn't do it anymore because we understood that people, uh, a, it was important for them to pay on time when they could. Um, and the other thing was, so I think the first three months was about learning, about being in touch with everybody. Our employees are here in Toronto, but we couldn't come to the office. So we, every morning we had a Zoom call and we wanted to have everybody connected and engaged. We were in touch with all the different parties that we work with in the, uh, the USA. I think collecting data uh, was uh, data was one of the most important thing because once you are you have the information you can make decision and you can direct uh, a, your employees you you know where you are and the last component was communication uh, timely communication with our investors which we kept doing 
uh, I didn't have like every month or every two weeks, but where I felt that there is uh, new information uh, that I, I need to share with the investors and we stopped all these distributions. Uh, again, I was preparing for the worst, uh, which a touch would did not happen. And I think it changed uh, over time and improved over time. Each state had its own uh, rules and regulations and different moratoriums, and we needed to learn a lot and uh, to uh, respond to that. And Avi, from your view, um, what were some of the biggest changes um, in the real estate sector? So I, I think that Haya and Mark have made some, some great points here, and maybe I'll just try to riff off of that a, a little bit. Um, first of all, you know, I think you've both um, had significant focus on sort of the multi-residential asset class. So maybe I'll try to, you know, pull out of that a little bit. But um, Chaya, I think your point about um, like the different, you know, in this micro versus macro theme, like the different time frames within the past two years. I mean, we could look from a macro point of view, we could look at it as this is this two year chunk of our lives, right, that we just went through. Um, but when we were at various stages within that, we were sort of riding waves. You know, there certainly was a lot of uncertainty. Um, there was a, there was fear and anxiety that was created. Um, you know, a lot of this came from from kind of mainstream media and mass media, and uh, you know, which in many ways I don't I don't think is great. It's become so polarized that you don't know what to you know what to believe anymore. But it also gave us the ability to kind of project and forecast and kind of have a running start. On elements of our business and, and how we thought we may address that, right? Given what what was about to come, um, so so I like that. And I think in terms of some of the things that we we've, we've done with our own business, maybe I'll I'll cast that aside for uh, later in this discussion. Um, and uh, and Mark, your point about uh, the, the global market, I mean that's been really interesting to me because I've I've noticed the the exact same thing. Like um, you know, amidst all this fear and anxiety you know, the world has kind of told us that uh, we're still interested in Canada. There's been, you know, exceptional amounts of foreign investment in Canada throughout the past few years and beyond. Like it, it hasn't really seemed to slow down. So as bad as we may think it is here now, the world is telling us Canada is not such a bad place, you know, uh, to do business. Um, and then to sort of pull it into commercial, you know, what I found interesting is growing up in, in, in the real estate industry and, and you know, similar to Anthony, who's had, who's really worked on a diversity of real estate asset classes, pretty much everything, um, and and we've sort of done the same. And, and growing up in the business, I always looked at the commercial side of the industry as following the residential trends. If they're building new, you know, condominiums or subdivisions of homes, then there's going to be a need for other services: educational, institutional, retail, office. You know, you sort of create these ecosystems. And now over the past few years, kind of for the first time, you know, in my memory, um, that's all changed, forcibly changed in many ways due to mandated lockdowns and closures of businesses, you know, specifically in, in certain asset classes, um, like retail, you know, where unless you're Costco or Walmart or, or a grocery store, you got to shut down, right? And so all of a sudden, um, the, 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 the retail trends are not necessarily following the residential trends. And and we've seen that kind of that dichotomy where uh, multi-residential has generally stayed fairly uh, fairly hot and resilient as an asset class. Industrial has obviously remained super hot, probably hotter than, than I could ever remember it being. A lot of that's been for warehousing, um, shipping, distribution, uh, what we call last mile, where you're seeing uh, you know so many people are ordering on on Amazon or, or groceries that they kind of need warehousing closer to where people live. Um, so that's been very hot. And I mean, through the pandemic, we've been involved in, uh, in some major deals with FedEx and with Amazon. And we've sort of you know, felt the benefit of that. Um, I could talk later about how we've kind of built a little bit of a, a recession-proof business because on a brokerage side, we represent sellers and we represent buyers. We represent landlords and we represent tenants. So even if that skews, we, you know, one of our groups becomes a lot more active. Um, and um, yeah, so we've seen we've seen sort of the, the decimation of certain asset classes. Retail, office has certainly obviously been hit hard, and you know the way we look at office space may forever change. Um, and even hotels and tourism, which obviously slowed down you know completely. 
almost ground to a halt. Um, so I think those are some of the significant changes. And I think one of the questions uh, looking forward is, you know, where do we go from here? But I'll, I'll turn the floor back to you, Sean. Oh, yeah. And the audience definitely wants to hear that. I want to give Anthony a chance to jump in here. Um, all these questions about the changes with work from home, increasing e-commerce. What, what have you seen um, in your view of the real estate sector? I, I've seen things that, um, you know, you thought would never happen. Um, you know, you're talking about a black swan event once hopefully in a lifetime event that's, that's, you know, we're ever going to see and hopefully never see it again. Uh, but it's put everything, uh, on its ear, right? Uh, so much so even publicly traded companies who were, um, you know, having their investor calls would not give any forward looking statements and any projections. I mean, when does that happen? Right? Uh, so nobody knows what, uh, you know, a company that was uh, a publicly traded company is even projecting to do during this time. They just said, we're not even going to bother to, to guess or give you projections because it's going to be so wrong. And of course, they're, 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 they were also trying to ensure that their, their company stock and value doesn't get upended with any statements that they're going to make and not be able to fulfill those statements and, and, and meet those targets. So that went out the window. So imagine companies not giving forward statements or future valuations and, and future projections on sales. So th then you add the backdrop of housing affordability. You, you, you add on the, the, the backdrop of an accelerated e-commerce world, which then has, has an issue with the, with the bricks and mortars, which uh, stores and the storefronts that Avi was talking about. Then you add to that a demand and supply issue. So not only do you have this COVID thing that has basically turned everybody's priorities upside down, what they thought was a priority in January of 2020 is completely changed two, three months later. So the human psyche has shifted. You have all these other things that are working within the Canadian economy. If you want to talk about even micro versus macro, even on a micro scale in GTA, you have a housing shortage, never mind affordable housing, but just units. Then you have this issue. So you have a demand and supply that's made this much more acute. You have an affordability issue, therefore, because you have a demand and supply uh, working against each other. And then, and then you have all these people that are looking for a place to live. And then they're saying, I don't want to live downtown anymore. I want to live out in the suburbs because why? Their, their interests and their priorities have changed. And they say, I don't want to go to work in an office anymore. There's just, it's just too many people. It's too crowded. I don't want the commute anymore. So all these things are all working against each other, mashing it up. And people are trying to figure out, okay, what's what? Where, where do I go? Do I, do I go to Hamilton? Do I go to St. Catharines? Do I go to Vaughan? Do, do, I, do I go to Whitby? Do I go to another province? So all these things were happening, and not just in the residential market, but even in the commercial market. I mean, go find a healthy re a commercial tenant today. Good luck. They've been decimated over two years because they've been shut and open and shut and open. You know, buying a restaurant, buying buying food, which we all know is perishable, and then having to close down uh, two weeks later. And and or you know, filling their their beer kegs that are no longer they can sell. So. Everything was just in disarray. And so you have all these forces that are happening in this backdrop of a local economy that is very unique, for example, to maybe what was happening in the US and other parts of the world. So we had all this to contend with and people are just jostling for position on what to do, what not to do. Should I buy the house? Should I, do, I, do, I, do I even want to live in a condo? Do I want to live in a, in a small, stinky little shack with a whole bunch of land around it because I don't want to be around people? So everything has changed. The human psyche has changed. This, this really played havoc on not just the real estate market, but how people actually look at real estate. They, they, started, look, they started shifting, right? They started shifting. Is, is it more an investment or is it more of a place to live and be, um, you know, live in a calm and more spread out area? Uh, uh, and do I want to, you know, now put, put the roots in and mm -hmm. do I want to stay where I am? What, what's my next move? So this has happened. The condo market in the downtown Toronto, you saw rental rates drop 
because of that human psyche, the shift. Now you see it coming back now. It's now just coming back. Offices are just coming back, but what does that mean to the workforce? Right now, if we were, we have 400 condos under management, over 100,000 condo units are under management. We're the largest in the country. People are looking at their condos as a very different thing today, right? You have your foreign investor, but then, you know, there's been a clamp down on the foreign investment because they added, they added additional hurdles, whether it be financing, whether it be um, uh, taxes and all that other stuff, right? We see that coming back a bit, right? So there's, there's, bit, there's a bit of a shift now. People are coming back to the downtown core. When did you ever have to, you know, pay uh, so much more on a premium on a pre-condo construction unit than you did on a current condo unit? Mm -hmm. So builders are now hedging much stronger and much bullish on pre-condo development than they are than, than what we can get for an existing condo. You know, 12, 1300 bucks a foot for a resale. 15, 1600, 2000, 2500 dollars for pre-construction that's going to come on market five, six years from now. So they've taken the profit. Effectively, the developers have taken a, the lion's share of the profit where you could buy a condo for 1200 bucks a foot, sell it in six or seven years for 15, 1600 dollars a foot, and take all the upside. Well, the builder's taken a lot of that off the table. So it's that end user now is coming back to the market, right? So hmm. I'm buying that condo because I'm going to lay my roots down. I'm going to, I'm going to stay in Toronto. Couple that with the hybrid work environment, which has also changed how we look at real estate, right? Do I need to commute every day? No, maybe you only need to commute one or two days a week. But the fact is I can now live outside the GTA or I don't need to live downtown you know, within walking distance of my office because I'm only going to go in once or twice a week because, mm -hmm. well, COVID has accelerated that hybrid work environment, the remote work environment. That was already moving in that way, but it certainly, it certainly made a lot of employers and employees for that matter, much more comfortable with the remote work environment. So now you're gonna see consolidation. Now they're talking about office towers that are now gonna be part condo and part office. So you have that, what, you know, you know, and, and I was uh, used to seeing this, you have this uh, mixed use development mentality coming much stronger into the environment in terms of what does that podium look like? Can we do the first 30 floors or 20 floors of office and the last 10, 15 floors of condos? This is what they're looking at. Because what you used to have is a workforce of 100 people sitting at 100 desks. It's now hoteling. You're going to have 50 people working this week and 50 people working next week, and they're going to use the same desk. So forget about paper because it's, it's useless. Everything's going to be in the, uh, is going to be e-filing e, um, e and, and e um, files and cloud computing, which is going to be huge. And then cybersecurity is going to be another issue. So things are changing and they're con we don't know where the dust is going to settle. This is just the beginning and nobody knows what the next 30 days or 60 days is going to hold. And if they tell you they know, they're only guessing. Sean? Well, that's great. It leads me into what I want to ask next is, uh, is about your guesses. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in from the audience here. Um, and there's definitely an appetite for a bit of forecasting. And I, and I think we've got a good opportunity here with our panel uh, to try and get a sense from you, at least, you know, in, in your own businesses and in your own part of the real estate sector, what do you see as, you know, potentially coming next? What are you anticipating? What are some of the sustainable trends in terms of the disruptions that occurred over the last couple of years as a result of the pandemic? Mark, maybe you can start us off there. Um, where, where do you see things going next for the real estate sector? What, what changes do you think are, um, are temporary and which ones do you think are going to last a little longer? Um, so, so again, just from, from my little, uh, you know, world, which is a rental housing. I mean, I, I think the demand will continue to grow quite strong. Like, I mean, uh, from an immigration perspective, you know, we're projecting 1.2 million, um, you know, immigrants entering the country over the next three years, most, you know, most of that immigration is, is coming here to the, you know, GTA and surrounding areas. So from a demand standpoint, I think the future is very strong. That's just one aspect of, of housing demand. Um, you know, supply, supply has been an issue and has been an issue for a very long time. Um, now, I know there's talk and measures uh, that will potentially address that, although, you know, supply uh, measures and policies 
you know, take longer to, to implement. So I don't, you know, I don't foresee supply catching up to demand anytime soon, um, which puts upward pressure, unfortunately, on uh, housing units, whether it's the rental units or even, you know, primary resident uh, demand, what, which is, you know, partly I think why prices have gone up in the residential side and even rental, even rental prices have gone up too. Um, so I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Um, and then also, I think as as housing does get more expensive, I think you know uh, people are forced to consider renting, whereas they may have considered purchasing. And so, you know, unfortunately, those that had plans of you know buying their first home, they're finding it very difficult to do so. Um, uh, but I think as, as Anthony mentioned, you no longer because of working arrangements and because they're changing and working from home is becoming uh, you know it's been the norm over the last two years, and I think that. Uh, that behavior will continue, uh, perhaps not work from home for five days, but perhaps two days a week, for example. So it's going to allow people to push outside the city a little bit more into the burbs, into um, other cities and towns that, you know, haven't experienced population growth for a long time. I think we're going to start to see that. Um, and so, so I think that's definitely going to stick. I, I don't, I don't foresee uh, demand uh, for housing changing anytime soon. I mean, there's too, there's too many factors that are pushing it upwards. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Haya, what are you seeing? Um, what are the changes you think are are temporary or, or lasting or what might we expect uh, next? I, I'm already looking ahead in the questions. There's some questions about changing interest rates and inflation. So um, I think that uh, for us as a business in the first year of uh, COVID, it was more about, let's call it surviving. And uh, our main activity uh, or, or strategy of growth, we put it on hold. So we didn't do any new acquisitions for a year. Also, lenders were not lending for six months until they learned the environment and uh, uh, put their uh, uh, strategy back to lend uh, for multifamily. Um, and uh, so we came back to invest uh, and buy, uh, I would say, in the past 10 months. And uh, we completed, uh, like we bought, and we saw that also others. So the competition is uh, very strong. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, money uh, looking to be invested. Uh, I agree with Mark that uh, multifamily is still a, a desirable uh, asset class uh, for investment on one hand, but also for tenants. Uh, I had a thesis that, uh, you know, after the 2008, 9, 10, it will be very hard uh, for uh, American to buy uh, homes and all the American dream will change. Uh, but uh, it will take about seven years for many people that uh, uh, get their credit history ruined by the, the financial crisis to clean it and come back. And, uh, and I thought it's this, uh, I think, venture that I'm starting is not going to be so exciting uh, in the eight or ninth years uh, since I started. But what we are seeing is that actually uh, prices of houses are going up and the ability of people to put a down payment is now going away from them. And the demand for rental uh, became stronger. Uh, we noticed that our communities are with close to 100% occupancy for the more than a year now, which we try not to be. Usually we like to be at 95%. We push the rent, we are getting a, a lower than the 100 and then it feels again and uh, you see the demand is very very strong uh, so this is one that uh, I wouldn't say change but I would say that actually became a stronger trend 
Uh, but one new trend that we see in the US, there is new, uh, uh, I think, uh, asset class that we didn't see before. It's called single housing rental. And you see new developer that this is a new product that they are developing and uh, offering. Uh, and basically uh, from seeing that people are moving from New York or Chicago, California to like the secondary markets uh, like Atlanta and Phoenix and Charlotte, uh, Austin, like cities like that. And uh, many people still work from home. So uh, this uh, is very interesting uh, product or uh, asset class, the single housing rental. Uh, it would be interesting to see where it is going. We are not into it, but uh, we are watching it and it is interesting. Um, so Avi, there's a, there's a question in the audience here um, about whether or not we'll see a real estate crash after the COVID pandemic. I'm getting a sense that the answer might be no, but I'm curious from your <laughs> perspective, you know, what about those, those retail properties? What about those commercial properties? Um, we've heard a little bit about the, the strength and persistence of the residential demand, both in rental and, and for new homeowners. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about those restaurants, those, those storefront businesses, um, as well as potentially offices, which have had the disruptions from, from restrictions or competition from e-commerce or work from home. Yeah, a great line of questioning. And I'll, I'll sort of try to touch on a little bit of all of that. Um, I'm not an economist, so you know I don't know if we're going to have a crash or where interest rates are going to go. But but I would say, like you know, from a just from like a, a reasonable, rational perspective, we've seen that real estate and the economy it rolls in cycles, um, and interest rates can't go down much further. So like in my mind, the, like there's only one direction for interest rates to go. Plus, you know, the the, the government has spent hundreds of billions. Uh, you know, throughout the past two years, you know, like the payback has got to come somewhere. So, but look, I am anticipating some some pretty like you know large waves, if you might call it that. Um, and and I think it's it's critical for all of us in business to to forecast as best we can and project, you know, for those types of things and you know risk mitigation and all that. And but I, I think looking at some of the specific asset classes, there's no doubt that there's going to be some transformation. Um, by the way, just to, again, I, I'm not an economist, but but I, you know, I found it interesting that at some point over the past decade, it was sort of announced that the planet, planet Earth, um, the population, we hit the, the over 50 percent of, of the, the population of the planet being in urban centers rather than than rural, um, and we might have seen a little bit of this migration, you know, out of out of the uh, urban centers, uh, you know, throughout the past couple of years. But um, I, I have little doubt that we're going to continue to see, you know, people wanting to live and work and play, um, you know, within the major urban centers. Um, and, you know, and the trends are there. Yeah, and and so as it applies to, you know, retail and commercial. Um, so I, there's this term that uh, I used to see growing up in real estate called flex space. And you you'd always see it, you know, relative to industrial warehouses, right? They'd be like, we have flex space for lease. And so, you know, the way I look at real estate, you know, I started thinking to myself, and again, maybe this is my philosophy background, but like questioning everything, like, why is it only an industrial? So I've started to apply the term flex space to, to almost every asset class that we look at, right? And so just as an example, like office buildings, I think there's no doubt that we're going to see transformation of office as people change their habits. First of all, there's an intrinsic flaw with, with many occupiers of office space. And if you take your typical downtown law firm who has like five floors, you know, of offices and, you know, the, uh, the nicest uh, decor is typically on the reception level where you've got all the art and all these massive boardrooms. It's an entire floor of boardrooms that are sitting empty for 90% of the day, right? And then, you know, for 10% of the day, when you want, when you want to get a boardroom, you can't because they're all booked. So how do you transform that kind of space? And monetize they're paying massive rents on space that they're not using to turn it into flex space right maybe there's other occupiers that they could bring in maybe there's other ways of using, uh, using it and i look at the same thing with you know hotels and restaurants like creating space like why does a ballroom in a hotel or a convention center need to sit vacant other than you know when it's being used for a party 
right? So maybe it could become a supper club or a lunch spot or a restaurant. And, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at transforming spaces. And I think that the big owners of shopping centers are, are doing the same thing. They're looking at, I mean, if you go to Yorkdale and you see what Oxford has done, they've created a concept called concept, right? And this is a permanent pop-up, right? They're, they're, they're always changing over their piloting new retail concepts, giving restaurants and retailers a chance to, you know, purvey their goods, see how the market reacts. It, it's not as large of an obligation to signing a 10 year lease. And if it works well, ultimately they could roll them into a permanent spot. So I think you're going to see more pop-ups. I think you're going to see um, all kinds of restaurants and food and beverage concepts um, in, in malls and shopping experiences, because that, you know, increases dwell time, prolongs the shopping experience, uh, brings in a diversity of customers. Uh, you're going to see that. Certainly what I mentioned earlier about last mile, you know, and, and where industrial warehousing, um, you're going to see way more of that. And that coincides with e-commerce. You know, I think almost all of us have, you know, gone online and ordered something over the past couple of years, if not completely changed our, our, our lifestyle and our patterns. So, you know, e-commerce is going to have a major impact too. And then lastly, um, you know, local uh, more than ever, I think is seen as a very positive thing, supporting local merchants, um, you know, saving the planet, sustainability, um, and uh, aligning with, with brands or local operators who kind of share similar values with us, who care about the carbon footprint that they create. Um, you know, it could touch on health and wellness. So there's all kinds of themes that are, that are emerging. All right, Anthony, this is your chance to take a risk and gaze into the crystal ball and, uh, and make one of those brave forecasts. Um, are you seeing similar trends? What are you seeing as kind of a resilient effect of the, of the pandemic? We've talked a little bit about yeah. transformation of office space into multi-use yeah. type uh, spaces. Anything else that you, you kind of see on the horizon? Yeah, just, you know, going back to your original question, and I think, you know, my, my fellow panelists have done a great job trying to, trying to crystallize or synthesize, you know, what, what could, what could possibly be on the horizon. And, um, you know, one thing for sure, expect change and that's never going to go away. Okay. Change is going to be a constant. Um, and, uh, when you think you've got it, it's already changed on you, whatever that got it is. Okay. So it, it's about being nimble, being flexible and what have you, uh, and, and, and learning from that and, and trying to get on, get on to the next. Right now, it's very unclear in my mind, what is the next big thing and or what is a sustainable trend, right? What is, what is going to last long enough that you can actually sink your teeth into, get, really get a good understanding of it and, and do something with it, wh whatever that is, right? It, it could be anything. Um, as it relates to real estate, listen, you know, the, you know, everybody says, when's the best time to buy real estate? Yesterday. That was the best time to buy real estate. So they've been talking about a bubble here and is it going to burst? Is it going to, you know, is, is the bottom going to fall out in the real estate market? They've been saying that for 20 years. It's 20 years now they've been talking about the Canadian, never not even the Canadian, but even just the Ontario or the greater Toronto area uh, bubble that's going to burst. It, it's, it, it's not going to burst. Um, if you look at history and you look at the real estate values and what's happening in real estate, the, Regardless of the class, let's just talk a little bit about residential at the moment because you know that's near and dear to everybody's heart because you need a place to stay, right? Is you see this cooling off happening, right? You see a little bit of a cooling off, then you see kind of like it starts to uptick. All things remaining equal, right? As an economist would say, ceteris paribus, all things remaining equal, you start to see that level back up. But are you an investor or are you an end user? Those are completely different philosophies. Which one are you? You might be both. Right, you might be both. You might be a end user first, and you might be an investor second. In some cases, you might be an investor first. Those are two different thinking caps and two different approaches, mentalities, and business cases. Right? Which one is it? So, if you're looking for a return on investment, that's a different mentality versus, hey, I need a nice place to live. I want to raise a family here. I want to make sure that I can have a, a dog that's more than 30 pounds in weight. What is that? I have a car that I need to use or my, I'm, I'm getting an electric vehicle. Can I plug it in? Those are different thinking caps. Those are different uh, uh, ways of looking at what, what is it? What is the purpose of that purchase? What is the purpose of that? And what's the end game? Those are two different things. Return on investment, capital appreciation, lower interest rates, 
or do I need a place to live? So that's what you need to get into your head first is what is it that I'm trying to achieve here? What's the end game? Then you start on that strategy and saying, okay, I don't care what the market's going to do. I got to live somewhere. Okay, so where do you want to live? Downtown Toronto, Hamilton, 905, what is it? And you go on and you make, you make that decision. You get in, you get it done, and you start living, start living your life versus what's that return? So yes, you're going to see change is going to be on, on the table forever. Cause I think things are so dynamic and what we, what we thought made sense yesterday has already changed. Things have changed since we've been on this call. Okay. Because the geopolitical situation is so unstable, right. That it's going to never mind what, you know, Canada, you know, and I agree with Abby and the others and Canada is a great place to invest. Why stability, strong middle-class stability of our political system, stability of our government. But then something happens way across the other side of the world that throws everything into disarray. What we thought we were coming out of a pandemic, what are we going into next? Nobody knows, but we're gonna be thrusted into something that we never thought was coming. Maybe we, we thought was coming. To what extent is that gonna impact us? We don't know. So stay curious, right? Uh, stay on a path of what it is important to you. What's your first objective? Stay close to that. Don't lose sight. There's always going to be noise. There's always going to be a disruptor, an accelerator, a decelerator. These are all new terms to things that we've been living through forever. We just call them different things, but it's the same thing, right? Piloting a new program. You know, we used to call in shopping center business when I was with Cadillac Fairview, temporary leasing. The objective, get the rent, get, get that space leased out. Now it's, hey, let's try a new concept. Oh, maybe they could stay with us. Can they pay the rent? It's just, so things are happening, but I'm telling you, the principles are the same principles. They have not changed. They're disguised as something else. They're called something new and funky, but it's the same principles. So stick to the strong principles. Don't go with the headline news. Change will always be it. Stay curious. John? Um, I know we're getting close to time and there were there's a lot of questions in the in the Q&A. We've touched on some of these, particularly about where we think the market might be going here. But I did want to make sure that we talk a little bit about um, advice for students who are interested in the real estate sector. Uh, there was a question about you know, opportunities for internships if you're interested in sales. Um, so I wonder if anybody uh, uh, might want to start just, just with a bit of advice for, you know, key skills that you see that are important in the real estate sector that, that students might want to keep an eye out for in, in thinking about where they're going uh, in their education and where they're going to go next. I mean, I, want to start I, us I, off? Yeah. I could jump in. Um, again, to, to me, like, you know, real estate is a microcosm of business. Business is a microcosm of life. So at the end of the day, like it's a human business. And, you know, I think there's a few key principles as we live our lives that should apply to anything we do to the extent that you can find things that you're passionate about doing and, and dig in on those. And as best you can uh, weed out things that you dislike because I think a lot of people end up on, on, you know, what I call the treadmill of life and they wake up, you know, and they're, not, and they're 65 years old and they're not, they're not yeah. well. And they've, they've, they've never done, you know, they never actually did what they wanted to do. So like, that's, you know, that's the biggest thing. Um, and then, you know, and, and stay active and stay positive, no matter what's going on kind of outside of that. And that's one thing I've coached, you know, my team on, including our young interns and, you know, and, and old timers, right. Stay active and stay positive. Um, because, you know, we've been bottled up and, they, they, you know, it's, th there could be a tendency to be inactive. And, and by definition, if you're not doing those two things, you're being inactive and you're being negative. And neither one of those things is healthy uh, or going to get you anywhere. Um, and then, you know, be yourself in all situations. Be yourself. Like when I speak with anybody who's getting into the business world or the real estate world, I want to know that they're acting themselves because everybody has their own special qualities and characteristics. And you need to let that out if you want to be successful in life. So I'll, I'll sort of turn the floor over to someone else. That's yeah, great. No, I'll, I'll add on to that if that's okay. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think I think I talked about it a little bit before. Get get those strong principles, right? Get get those fundamentals, right? What what York provided me was the strong fundamentals, right? Understanding the fundamentals of the market, marketplace, demand, supply, all these wonderful things get the strong fundamentals. As my dad would always say, stay in school. But I might say, but dad, I, someday, someday I got to get out of school. He goes, stay in school. Anyways, the point of that is 
you know, take those learnings, but get those fundamentals well in hand. So that's the first thing, right? You got to get invited to the party first. Whether you get the dance or not comes later. Get invited to the party. Get, get a good, strong, strong foundation, which I think York has certainly provided me, uh, and get those under, uh, under wraps. Then you got to say to yourself, okay, I got the strong fundamentals. What's next? Well, find a way to apply them, right? Whether it's real estate, whether it's something else. But in terms of real estate, and assuming that's why you're all here, you're interested in real estate, is it's fundamentals. Real, real estate is an old business. It's been around for generations. It's going to be around for ever and ever. It's going to change. It's going to look different. We're going to call it something else, but it's still fundamentals. Get down into the fundamentals. Get that strong base. Stay curious. Make sure you can adjust and you can, you know, we talk about pivot. I don't like to use, you know, the headline stuff, but really be able to pivot, meaning when, when it's changing under your feet, you got you to be there, right? What, what Grexy's father said to him, don't go where the puck is. Go where the puck's going to be. Mm -hmm. because if you're going to go where the puck is, it's already too late. Puck's off over there now. So go where the puck is, but you got to know what is, what's the puck in your life? What is it that you want to, you want to pursue? And then you got to learn using those strong fundamentals, how to get there before the puck gets there. What, the puck could be anything. It's just a matter of you, you got to forecast, you got to think ahead and you got to stay curious and anticipate. And you're never going to get it hundred percent, but that's okay. hundred percent doesn't count. If you're close enough, you will be successful. You'll never be perfect and you'll never be 100%. Sean? Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, any other skills or advice, Haya? Uh, I just wanted to say uh, for the question of uh, one of the students uh, about uh, job opportunity. Uh, so I think in general, uh, real estate is like uh, any other business. Uh, and in particular, uh, for Emma Capital is looking for financial analysts, so people can go on our website and apply. Awesome. Uh, and Mark, uh, I'll turn it over to you for, for any closing thoughts or advice for students uh, interested in the real estate sector. Yeah, I think, um, so I was surprised. So before I got into real estate, I did not think it was as creative as it is, right? So I think real estate does require a lot of creativity. There's a lot of ways to think about it. It's not just bricks and mortar. That's just kind of one small piece of it. So I, I think if, you know, for those that are looking for uh, a career that, you know, allows you to, you know, to be creative uh, and not creative just from an art sense, but just negotiation skills, coming up with new ways of thinking, collaborating with people. There is so, I, I mean, I did not think this before I got into real estate and just, I'm so happy that, you know, I, I am in it because it, it stretches so many uh, ways of thinking and doing different things. Um, it's, it's not boring at all. It just, there's just so many avenues. And I think uh, no matter, no matter which path you started on um, and where you want to go, I think real estate provides, uh, you know, a, a, a runway for, for a, a ton of different paths for, you know, for your career. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, after the hour here, I hope it's become clear for, for the audience. This is a really dynamic uh, industry to be in. Um, and for those of you interested in business, you know, it's yeah. one of the oldest businesses. Um, so uh, we do we do have to wrap up now. Um, so I will give some closing remarks here. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists um, for sharing uh, their experiences, their insights, uh, and some of their forecasts about the real estate sector. Uh, I think this is a really valuable discussion for, for our audience here today. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Haya. And thank you, uh, Mark. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is our last Moving Forward webinar uh, event for this academic year, but we're going to be back in the fall with more LA and PS alumni who will be here to share their amazing stories and insights with you. You can find all the recordings for the Moving Forward series on the Moving Forward website and on the LAMPS YouTube channel, uh, where there's a separate playlist for the Moving Forward series. You can go take a look at uh, those and, and hear from all the alumni uh, who spoke with us this year. Um, these webinars are packed with advice and tips on how to get the career that you want. So give them a watch um, and take some time uh, to learn about all of the different places our, our graduates have gone um, after their time at York. Thank you all again for attending, and we look forward to delivering more Moving Forward webinars uh, featuring our fantastic alumni next year. Thanks so much for coming out, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.